Okay, maybe I'll get started as people start to join. Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Sarah Fogg and I'm head of communications at the Montreal Holocaust Museum. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us for this book launch of I Want You To Be Free. Our event today is organized in partnership with our museum, the Eleanor London Code St. Luke Public, Public Library and Hobart Books. Today, we will hear more about the remarkable life story of the late Renata Skonica Zeidman. From her upbringing in Warsaw to loss and resistance during the Holocaust and rebuilding life and family in Montreal, we will be expertly guided through her story by her daughter, Sharon Nadia Zeidman, the author or co-author of I Want You To Be Free. During this event, we'll hear from Adam Gardner, director of Hobart Books, followed by a reading from Sharon, illustrated with precious photos from Renata's life. Then Sharon will be interviewed by Alice Herskovich, consultant for donor and government relations at the Montreal Holocaust Museum. Before opening up for questions from you, the audience, we'll hear a clip of Renata's testimony recorded by the USC Shoah Foundation, and then concluding remarks from Maria Racina at the Eleanor London Coates and Luke Public Library. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Adam, at Director of Hobart Books. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was just trying to find my mute button. Yes, well, uh, thank you for the invitation to come. Um, I'm based over in the UK, as you might tell by my accent, where it is a little bit after 7 p.m., hence the reason that it's a little bit dark here. Um, <laughs> so the story uh, that we have here, well, back in the summer of 2021, Hobart Books was uh, a fledgling publishing company, and we still are. We're only two years old. It was our birthday yesterday, in fact, our second birthday. Um, and we, we pitched ourselves to fill a particular niche in the publishing world um, as a publisher of accessible fiction, um, specialising in crime and military thrillers. So fiction, thriller. Um, we'd also pledged to publish works from promising authors who had never before been published. So, you know, completely fresh. So all of that was going very well in 2021. We uh, had a nice list of nine books by different authors. Um, we were all crime thrillers or military thrillers. Then along came Sharon. When we received the manuscript of I Want You To Be Free, we, we didn't really know what to do with it. Um, Sharon was already a published author, and this was not a thriller. It was thrilling, but it was not a thriller. It was not certainly not fiction. According to our own rules, we should have rejected this manuscript, but it was just so good. We, we just could not reject it. So we bent the rules. So we took it, we, we agreed to, um, to look closely at the manuscript, do what's called the assessment of the manuscript, and um, which is the first stage of publishing. Um, so we, we look at it to see if it's worth publishing, whether it makes sense, if it's, if it's going to be saleable, if it's going to have interest um, in the wider community. Normally we have to read the entire thing or at least a very good portion of the book uh, to get a good, good opinion of it. But within the first few pages, we were gripped. And we knew that with um, I Want You To Be Free, we, we had an important book on our hands. It was a really easy decision to make. And so we, we set about the process of publishing. So we, we started with the developmental editing, the copy editing, pulling photos together, et cetera, et cetera. And then culminating with proofreading and printing and, and so on and so forth. In that time of um, publishing the book and going through the process of publishing the book, um, I got to know Sharon and the significance of her work very, very well. Um, she, I felt the, the bond that she had I, I could, through our communications, which were almost exclusively via email, we did speak, I think, once, maybe twice, but all of our communication was by email and the written word. And through that, I felt the bond that she had with her mother, Renata, and her father, Abram, and, and all of her wider family and, um, and family friends. But more than anything, I felt the sense of duty she had in preserving their memory as well as the memory of the friends and relatives that her parents carried with them. This is the prevailing theme, the theme of memory, of, of never forgetting. And the, the description of the book states, this is memory, memory with a capital M. This is why it's so important. 
It was clear that Renata's story was more than just another Holocaust story. And I don't mean that in any kind of derogatory way. Of course I don't. There's a lot of Holocaust stories out there and they, they do seem to follow the same kind of pattern. Terrible events, stories of fortitude and survival. But Renata's story is more than that. It's looking forward. Yes, it did look backward to the hell of the Warsaw Ghetto, but two thirds of the book is looking forward to a new life, but at the same time, never forgetting, never forgetting family, friends, relatives, people who just didn't make it, didn't make it out of, out of um, Warsaw. Reading the book, being part of the book um, and bringing it to the world was uh, something really special. I'm delighted that I and that our little company, Hobart Books, could be part of that. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sharon Nadia Zeidman, reading from the memoirs of her mother, Renata Skotnitska Zeidman. I want you to be free. Sharon, Thank please. Thank you, Adam. My mother was an intrepid traveler. As a child, she dreamt of traveling the world. As a teenager, she traveled in ways that were unimaginable. Here, we join her on the last lap of her first journey overseas. It is late in 1948. During the second week of December, the displaced persons boarded a North Star at Gatwick, bound for Gander, Newfoundland. In Gander, Renata's journey was delayed by a classic Canadian blizzard. While waiting for the storm to pass and the plane to refuel, Renata noticed a buck-toothed, weak-chinned woman sitting on the opposite side of the intimate lounge. She recognized the woman from movie newsreels. The woman was traveling with her son James. She was returning from Paris, where, at a United Nations General Assembly, she chaired the session which ratified the document she had drafted, a document which, which would become her greatest legacy, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Extracting from her little red suitcase an American dollar bill, Renata approached. Waving the bill at the woman, she mined the motion of writing. Pani Rosa Welt, Brosche! Renata was offering the bill to Eleanor Roosevelt so she could sign her name on it. A lesser being might have been startled by the apparition of a homeless refugee waving money at her, but FDR's widow took it in stride. Obliging, she fished for a pen in her purse and good-naturedly signed her autograph on Renata's bill. It was the least she could do, and one imagined she knew it. Though considered a bleeding-hearted pest during her time in the White House, even FDR's widow underestimated the danger to Europe's Jews. One of the first to sound the alarm, she faltered in following through, failing to spur Franklin into enacting legislation which might have saved many. As much as the former First Lady had achieved and would continue to achieve, her failure to rescue Europe's Jews through her influence on the late president plagued her conscience for the rest of her life. In early winter, the North Star flew from Gander to Toronto. All the other refugees on this flight would settle in Toronto. Renata was going to Montreal. A representative of the Canadian Red Cross handed her a $5 bill with which to begin her new life in a new land. Protectively, Renata tucked the bill into the cleavage of her brassiere. On their application forms, the displaced persons were given a choice of settlement in either Toronto or Montreal. Renata chose Montreal because of the tales of this city told to her by the Parisian prisoner of war, Roger Bouillon. Renata sat ramrod straight on the hardback seats in the coach compartment while passengers filed past on their way to the club car. 
The scent of roast beef and mashed potatoes wafted through the compartment. Renata breathed it in, as if the smell alone could nourish her. She was faint with hunger. A black porter in a black uniform and black cap approached Renata, pen and notepad in hand. What would you like for dinner, miss? Renata flinched. The sight of a man in a uniform, in any uniform, frightened her. She stiffened. Can I get you something to eat, miss? The porter put it another way. Because she didn't understand the question, Renata didn't answer. The patient porter handed his pen and notepad to Renata. You write down what you would like to have, miss. Renata was terrified. She wrote her name, social status, DP, and place of destination. She handed the notepad and pen back to the man in the uniform. The porter's warm, dark eyes widened. Chuckling, he shook his head and returned to the dining car. He seemed to have given up. But no, a few moments later, the kindly porter was back, balancing a cup of hot black coffee and a warm white roll. As famished as she was, Renata didn't dare break her $5 Canadian bill, nor even her $1 American bill. Certainly not now that it had Eleanor Roosevelt's autograph on it. To the porter, she pointed out her empty pockets. The sympathetic porter indicated that the coffee and roll were on the house. Gratefully, Renata almost grabbed the offering out of his hands, gulped the coffee and devoured the roll. The black man's warm, dark eyes lingered on the poor young thing, and then he returned to the club car. At Montreal's Windsor Station, on the evening of December 13th, a stranger awaited Renata's arrival. Ladovsky had sent an emissary. He was a business associate. His name was Albert Wiener. Wiener welcomed Renata to her new life in Canada with a bouquet of flowers and a bouquet of food. This gentleman almost became my father. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sharon. I have to say that it's it's truly a pleasure and an honor to be part of this interview, um, part of this remarkable book that was written by you, Sharon. I'm going to call you Sharon because that's how I know you, although your your name is is Sharon Nadja Zygman. Um, it was truly a privilege also to know Renata in the latter part of her life. I met her in 2007 at the Holocaust Museum, and she, um, she had a great impression, she left a great impression on me as on so many people. Today seems like a remarkably significant day, International Day of Commemoration of Victims of Genocide, and the day the UN has declared the day to prevent genocide, to remember the Convention on the Prevention of Genocide to remember Renata and her story. Um, I just want to say a few words, although you've so spoken so beautifully, read so beautifully from your, your work, but the significance of this work, I want you to be free, is that it offers so much to the reader. It offers Holocaust history, an amazing immigration story, stories, many of which are very difficult of horror and hate and loss, and others which speak to solidarity and resilience and hope. And all of these stories are immersive because of your beautiful imagery and prose. And um, it's certainly a book worth reading because of your storytelling skills. So I'm, I'm going to say to you that uh, just at the beginning, you have, you know, you really have taken on this role that your mother gave you of the memory keeper and um, that's one of the very worthwhile reasons to, to read this book. I'll start with some very simple questions. Um, 
you you chose to write this book, but you chose not to write it simply as a, a Holocaust or a war memoir, but as a complete work of in three parts. Can you tell us a bit about why you made that choice? As a young girl, my mother was robbed of everything. Parents, innocence, country, language, education, inheritance, even her identity. She was spared nothing except her life. What she did with that life was extraordinary, and that is what I wanted to celebrate. Mum was a force of nature who would have blazed no matter what the circumstances. But to rise from rubble and ruin and end up being awarded the order of merit from the country that betrayed her was astounding. How I'm a writer, I was presented with material that was almost unavoidable. You had mentioned in our previous conversations that one of your, your goals in writing this book was to give your mother some, some immortality to get to. Could you speak a bit to that? Well, personally, um, uh, you know that she died of cancer, which is ugly and brutal. Uh, but to die of a cancer that is curable if caught on time, but was not because of a doctor's negligence to me was slow murder. I, she faced her end with a courage that was almost unreasonable. And I, my brother, we could not save her life. So I set out to give her immortality. Decades ago, something like this was foreseen for me. Uh, we, I don't know if everyone, I t most of us tend to dismiss what comes easily to us. And I dismissed my literary talent. That was a little bit too much pressure put on me. I think my mother also recognized it. So she didn't want to put, she encouraged it, but she didn't want to pressure me because she knew that my teachers were doing that. Um, and I turned away from, from writing for a long time. But I had a teacher who said to me, I don't care what you think you want to do. You are a writer. It's your destiny. You can't avoid it. And she added something else. She said, you're not going to have an early success. You're going to go through hell first. And when you come out on the other side, you're going to create a masterpiece. At the time, I thought to myself, lady, you've been watching too many Hollywood movies. Um, I was up in the middle of the night when Adam's email came in because we're five hours, you know, it was morning for him, but the middle of the night for me, I'd gotten some tragic news that night about the death of a friend's son. And uh, so I was up when the first emails arrived from England. And I stared at Adam's emails and I remembered my teacher's prophecies. I wasn't excited. It was bittersweet. I was relieved. I said, well, but they were all gone, including my mother. I remember that teacher saying, I don't know if I'll live to see it, but I know it's going to happen. And but I guess I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you here. Sure. I think part of it is that that they're not all gone, and and your recording of this life story makes that permanence part of the current reality, part of everyone's reality, and it opens it up. I, I'm going to go on to a question about because in the book there's there's a really a marked change when your your father enters the picture, um, and uh, what was a very difficult and challenging life as an immigrant becomes something a little different. Can you talk to us about that? Oh, 
just just thinking about my father makes me smile. Um, my father brought healing, stability, and laughter. My father was also a Holocaust survivor, although his story was quite different. And the age, the age range was different, although there didn't seem to be a generation gap. If anything, mom would say to him, I feel like I have three children and you're the biggest baby of them all. But he made it his mission to replace tears with laughter. That was his way. Whether it was on the face of a child or a fellow Holocaust survivors, when daddy was alive, our home rang with laughter. I was, I was remembering yesterday for some reason, we're the same generation, if you remember Johnny Carson, I mean, he was the focus of our time in the 70s. And five nights a week, I suppose the Brits would not know this, but you can capture enough of it. He would cut his assistant, Ed McMahon, would come on TV and say, here's Johnny. And daddy would say, here's mommy. <laughs> and I remember that yesterday. I just started to laugh. I, I got it for the first time, the star of the show. Here's mommy. My mother said he died. He died almost 40 years ago. It will be 40 years in April. He was younger than I am now. I miss him and his presence is felt to this day. My mother said, when I met your father, I stopped, lo I stopped noticing the loneliness. She said, I stopped mourning my parents. So many times she would say, I made many mistakes in my life, but marrying your father wasn't one of them. She had 30 years with him and 30 years without him. But and I knew there wouldn't be anybody else after him. I knew it couldn't be. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for sharing that with us. The, the, you're talking about family. And honestly, the book sets out a series of very complicated relationships with family members. Um, you know, times of difficulty, times of challenge in relationships, reconciliations, searches, which go on for decades, really. Can you tell us a bit about why family is uh, so central to your story? Well, I think it's central to Jewish life anyway, in, in reality and in literature. Um, and it's important to most people. Um, whether it was more important to my mother because she had lost so much family, I. I can't say, but when I think that she ended up join, joining a Jewish genealogic, Jewish gene, genealogy, genealogical society, that seemed to be a natural extension of search for family. Like my father would say, oh, I would be your mother, I would climb the family tree to find the roots. <laughs> but um, if, it wasn't consistent. She missed it. And yet she also recognized the pain that they could cause and the tyranny that they could cause. She came from a troubled family. She came from a very large family, but it was also a troubled family. Her parents were legally separated, so she had two homes. Um, you would think that by definition, Holocaust survivors would cherish family more than most people, but I only had to look as far as my father's relatives to know that just because you're caught in history doesn't mean you learn from it. Was it more important to her? I can't say, really. One of the interesting things about the book that you wrote is that it gives us a sense of really a, a non-fictional family saga through many generations. I think that's one of the things that readers will appreciate about it. You know, you know what I recognized after, I, can't, I don't know if I even finished the book now. I mean, when it was almost close to publication, I picked up, oh, I had a co-author, I mean, supernaturally. I picked up a document and realized that I left out a couple of people and I, I was kind of shy about it, but I asked Adam, I forgot something, would you let me add, you know? But, oh, I lost the train of my thought. Um, 
we were talking about the, a family saga. Yeah, historical when I family. finished it or seemed to have finished the book, I realized that I had written a family saga. And that was my mother's favorite genre. My mother loved, whether it was literature or film, she loved the idea of, and she said it in one of her testimonies, the continuity of family, that generations die, individual, it's not the end, but the family goes on. She once said that she thought, I don't believe it, but that she survived her role in survival was to restart a new line. She did a lot more than that. I mean, she was not awarded the Order of Merit for being a Jewish mother. But um, it was reconnecting and picking up a link. But within a family saga, I mean, as most people know, uh, there is turbulence and there are lesser lights and highlights and there's trouble and there's pain and there's disputes and misunderstanding. You show, you show it all. I, I'm going to ask you a question actually about people who are not family, but in a sense who become as significant and sometimes more significant than family in your story, in, in your mother's story, in Rana's story. Because yeah, well, could you, could you speak to that a bit? Some of the people who just were, were so important to her life. Well, during the war, it was crucial. I mean, these people, and I, 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 I sought to portray this gallery of spectacular characters who not only risked their own lives, but they risked the lives of their families in order to protect my mother. They did this repeatedly and for years. They defied prevailing laws, followed the dictates of their conscience. Most of them survived, one did not. Um, that woman's memory haunted my mother for decades. As she got older, it became more and more imperative for her to, to keep alive the memory of these people. She charged, my mother charged me with writing that woman's story, I thought, oh God, it would take a Dickens to do this. So this book really started, quite, chunks were written in real time, not after. It started because she wanted me to write the story of the woman she considered her surrogate mother. But in order to tell that story, I needed the other story. Yeah. These people were not Jewish. If there had been more like the more Jews would have survived. Um, but it's also true that my mother came from a very progressive family. So when trouble came, there were my my mother did was not raised with a ghetto mentality. Religion was, you know. So there there were a lot of friends on the other side to help. My mother, it took her a lifetime even to piece together, how did I survive? She, she came to the conclusion that the seeds of her survival were planted in childhood because she had such progressive parents and uh, was able to mingle with the Gentiles. I mean, on Saturdays before the war, she would sit, be sitting in cate catechism class with her best friend who later became Mother Superior at the Conralite Monastery in Wood. So it was a very different story. It's an extraordinary. Um, and it did continue later into my generation. It, there was no design to it, but uh, we ended, um, my brother and I ended up having, there were a surrogate grandparents were a middle-aged German couple who lived neighbors, escapees from East Berlin. And I didn't even realize how extraordinary this was. I mean, we shared Christmas with them. 
we didn't sit for Seder with my father's family, but I remember my brother always had the, we would help to decorate the Christmas tree and my brother had the honor of sticking the star on top of the tree. And I thought nothing of it. No. Well, th those people, I mean, that particular couple of Troutmans, I believe really were your, your caregivers when your parents were at work. So it's a remarkable, remarkable relationship. Well, it actually started uh, during an epidemic, uh, the Hong Kong flu of 1959. My brother was three months old. We were all sick. Somebody had to take care of him. I don't know how Mrs. Troutman was found through a network of neighbors. And she, I, he, he was rescued. He was rescued again. So uh, really in a, an appropriation, a, a development around family, which is really uh, particularly special when family doesn't exist. I'm, I'm going to go on to a question really about something you mentioned earlier. Your mother was awarded fairly late in life, um, the Polish Order of Merit. And in the book, you speak to that ceremony briefly and say that really she didn't, she didn't know why she was receiving it. Why do you think your mother received that oh, oh, it was well, it was obvious to everybody else. Um, my mother, um, in my mother's attitude evolved. When I was born, she would not speak Polish to me. She said, my children have no grandparents to speak to. They don't need it. They're in Canada. They need English and French. A time came she wouldn't even speak Polish to my father unless they wanted to hide something from us. It became a secret language. She wanted nothing to do with Poland, like most survivors. Uh, there was a transition when she was approached by the Trade Commission, my parents were importers, to open trade in what was still communist Poland in the 1970s. She was nervous about it, ambivalent about it, but she did go back to Poland and it changed her. She recalled the friends, she recalled the rescuers. Um, she started to go back to Poland as a businesswoman, as an importer. The first students that she took on a tour were me and my brother. <laughs> this was before it became trendy. So by the time the concept of Holocaust education became mainstream, she was in a perfect position. Um, she began to what is the word she began to integrate her past she be, because she was a child there were many things she didn't know about uh, that she discovered and she began to find people and to, to integrate the past and realize her own story and she made it her mission to say thank you and for her saying thank you meant getting these people honored and recognized. And ultimately, she was honored and recognized for doing so. She was terminally ill, 2011. She didn't even know if she could make this trip. Um, she had been working behind the scenes for 10 years to have the um, gathering of the international network of child survivors to have their meeting held in Warsaw, which was very significant. She made it happen and didn't know if she'd be able to join them. My brother said, buy the tickets, I'll go with you. So it was, she didn't know what was coming. She was in a wheelchair, uh, Michael, my brother was a doctor and took care of her, was with her. And she was awarded the Order of Merit by the Polish government for her role in building bridges of understanding and reconciliation between Polish Catholics and Polish Jews. Amazing. It was amazing. Amazing. Um, your mother faced death many times when she was young. In fact, her, her, her first years were just escape after escape from death. And in the end, she, she died from cancer here in Canada um, at a much older age, nonetheless. Can you tell us about how she faced 
her death, her the one that she knew was coming. I think it's like there's some learning there for people. The, the, the courage was was what was almost uh, the courage. It just kicked in again. Um, on a practical level, what we did was to speed up. Um, I was in the hospital with her. She did not die in hospital. She asked my brother to help her die at home, which he did. In the last few days, um, the palliative care team wanted to take her to hospital. They felt Michael was burning out, and he was burning out. I mean, his, I, I saw that his judgment was becoming impaired. He refused. He absolutely refused. He promised her, and he was going to keep his promise. My brother was heroic. But within those last few years, we speeded up. Um, there was a drug, an experiment. The drug was not that experimental. It's just it wasn't recognized. In the Quebec didn't want to pay for it. But she was. She proved. She became a candidate for this drug. It kept. It gave her another two years. But there were a lot of. We were in hospital three times a week with for infusions. We didn't waste our time. During the period in hospital, um, I recorded her. We sat all day. In the morning, you get the blood drawn, you wait hours for the results, and it starts. We spent the days in hospital recording, going over her private memoir, which she wrote as a reference for us, and recording what she would do. She would hand me a few pages at a time. I would read them at home. She said, have you any questions? You know, and I don't know if you know the um, Fahrenheit 451, Ray Bradshaw. Yeah, sure. um, for if it's the temperature at which paper burns, and it's it's a story of a future time when books are banned, and a group of people resistance. They go into the forest and they become the book. Each person takes yeah. on. They no longer have an. I don't know. They no longer have a name. They are the book. You get Oliver Twist, Tale of Two Cities. They would become a book and they would memorize the book. This was, of course, at a time when e-books did not exist, but that was the idea. They would become the book. And there was a scene in the book where an old man is dying and his grandson is sitting beside him. And the grandfather is reciting the book and the grandson is repeating. He is transmitting the book to his grandson. That's how I felt. That's how I felt in hospital. So that I was receiving it from her. the story. Well, she wanted to give it to me, yes. but, I, but I wanted to absorb it. My mother was on morphine when she was making notes for me. Still making notes for me. So, so on that note, honestly, the end of the book is, is particularly powerful because it speaks, well, I think you had an, an objective. I'm going to give you an objective. I don't know if you set out with this objective in mind, but to, to transform the perception, the public perception of Holocaust survivors. Yes. And you end your work with a quote from your mom's memoir. And I, I'd like you to read it, yeah. if you don't mind to end our sure. Our psyches have been dissected. We've been placed on exhibition, treated like passive objects and betrayed. So I plead for the dead in order to defend their memories. I plead for memory and decency. It's all I can do. And I remember. Remembrance is the marrow of my Jewish identity. I carry memory like a precious gift and a relentless curse. Memory is at the core of my identity. I have no choice but to carry it with me. Thank you, Shane. Well, I think, I think from that powerful message from your mother, we will go to her powerful video. Um, 
Yeah. It shall come. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> we have an image. We will have a video. I think it's very important. It was uh, first started with, and I broke my silence. I think it's very important. It was a delayed shock. Uh, first started with Eichmann trial and I realized what really happened to me and uh, I was reliving it again nightmares started horrible nightmares and flashbacks and then of course but I still was very passive but Zundel case got me out of my passivity and I became an activist and I work in the Holocaust Center and I talk about my experiences, whoever wants to hear, to children, to adults. Each time I, well, I'm a docent at Holocaust Center. Each time I tell my story, I feel it's like an open heart surgery. And it's over and over. And I'm one of the last witnesses, so. My days are mine now, and I can do with them what I want, and that's what I do with them. I know it's hard. My children sometimes object to it. They're afraid that uh, it might kill me. I'll die anyway, but at least mm -hmm. uh, I want my children to know that I, I have no regrets what I'm doing. And it's not that I like to, to be a Holocaust star. It's far from it, but I feel that this is something I survive, especially this is something which in one of the hiding places, I was with two amazing people. They were brother and sister. Richard, it was my sort of my first boyfriend, was a medical student, and his sister Danuta, she was my role model. And they had all the chances to survive. I didn't. And I remember Richard saying, one of us has to make it and tell the story. So this is uh, something which I'm doing in their name. Richard said, they'll never take me alive. And yet he was hiding and, and he was dragged down uh, by a Ukrainian with a dog. He was hiding and he was shot. And Danuta and her mother were taken to Treblinka and had all the papers and everything. So I'm the one to survive. My brother was, uh, it's another myth of Jewish passivity. I came from a family of fighters, so this is my fight. My brother was in the resistance. He was in the Polish Air Force. Then he was fighting in Warsaw Ghetto. He was fighting in Polish uprising. One of my uncles was well-known Alexander Skotnitsky, a partisan, very well-known in the history books, so I'm not just talking about something which could not be verified. So this is my way of resisting. I know it's late, but it's a continuation, I guess. Are there any other uh, organizations that you are participating in? I belong to Jewish Genealogy Society, and I was able to, I called it lost and found, I was able to trace for some Polish child survivor there, reunite them with their families. It's a bittersweet reunion because uh, it's too late, really, but uh, so I'm able to help them out. And I found my family, part of my family, thanks to my daughter, who had an amazing interest in my past, Amazing, and my son gave me tr three grandchildren, but my daughter gave me part of my family back, and for that I'm grateful. And I found him 10 years ago, just now, October 87, my cousins, and we are in touch. And 
uh, so that's Jewish genealogy and my own family because I was able to find my family I know how to trace anyway I'm trying to trace other, other people and as I said my involvement with the Polish survivor group is very immense I feel that I'm and their ambassador uh, their spokesman and I work in the Holocaust Center I am also uh, associate director of uh, Living Testimonies, which is an oral history project for McGill. And now, believe it or not, I'm sitting on this chair, but usually I am sitting across and I'm interviewing other people for Spielberg. So my tragedy became our tragedy. It took off, it took off an edge of my own pain. You know, it validates my own stories my own survival. So that's what I'm doing and I hope that my children will understand that this is an obsession and, and I'm doing it because I feel I have to do it. And they shouldn't worry about my mental state or about my physical health because time is running out. Yeah. Can you take this opportunity to speak directly to your grandchildren and to uh, the children of the future? Well, I hope one day my grandchildren or their children will commemorate peace, not murder. And my story is an unusual story because I met so many wonderful people and they made a difference. Each time I tell my story, I feel that this is a monument to Janka. I don't know where she is buried, but this is my monument to Janka. Obviously very, very powerful. Um, I, I know that we are waiting for questions and uh, from the audience, so I'm, I'm going to encourage people to either write their question or to speak up. Um, Sarah will be helping. Uh, here, I see one question coming in now. Uh, this is for you, Sharon. As we lose the survivor generation, I'm sorry, I just... As we... <laughs> As we lose the survivor generation, what do you think is the role of the second and the third generation? That's a question addressed directly to you, I think. Be kind. Be kind to people. I saw, um, years ago, I saw um, an inscription on a tombstone and it said, I am your monument. You are my monument. Sorry. You are my monument. Remember me with deeds, not with words. Just be kind. Be a mensch. Be kind. That's all you need to do. It's, it's not complicated. You believe that is the way that we best can remember people who, who died for no reason other than their religion or their their. By, well, when I say be kind, I mean be kind to everybody. I, I, exactly. I'm, I'm, I, I'm sorry if I thank you for... Yeah. Uh, um, to me, well, to me, it's obvious it means everybody because I, I was raised that way. Um, just be open, be open-hearted, and be open-minded. And be kind. An, an additional question. How, how did the loss of your mother's family during the Shoah affect your life going up? Did the absence of your grandparents and relatives impact your understanding of the world? Yeah. Um, well, unlike most um, second generation, I mean, I didn't feel uh, the loss of grandparents because I knew where they were. They were on the wall. Three of them. My mother found an image of her father years later. 
Those are our grandparents. They're on the wall and before the war, they used to be real. I understood this. My brother wanted a grandmother, not a grandfather. I don't even know where he got the idea of one. He missed a grandmother. I think that my parents understood more what we were missing than we did. And I think, especially my father felt they wanted to make up for all the people who were missing. That's how I see it now. They yeah. gave you, yeah. They, I mean, they gave so much because they understood more than we did what we were missing. But I cannot say that we didn't have extended family. We did have extended family. But the extended family that we had were not people who could be trusted or relied upon. So what happened? Other people, like the German couple, became family. Um, we reached, both my parents were, my mother could not have been that way without a spouse who was not the same way. They were both receptive open. My father's attitude was, yeah, you may get hit, you may get called names, but you got to learn to be out there, out in the world, and be in the world and live with people, not to hide in a ghetto and be afraid. My father was a Zionist before Zionism became a dirty word. That's how he identified himself. He was a shomer. I'm going to... Um... I'm going to ask, uh, you know, there's a question coming from Toby Shulman, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm going to ask her if she would like to speak her question so we okay. can actually hear, hear a voice other than our two voices, which have been going on for a bit. Toby? Yeah. Hi, Toby. Go ahead, Toby, please. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Hi, Alice. Hello. Uh, I, I missed the first few minutes of your presentation, and I was just wondering if you could tell uh, us the timeline. When your parents arrived, were you and your brother born here in Canada, or were you with them when they came here? Do I look that old? <laughs> um, uh, no, my parents came separately. Separately? Um, separately. They did not. No, they met here in Canada. Ah. No, no, no. They met in Canada in 1953. My mother called it a pickup. Um, they were both involved with other people at the time, and within 10 days, my father proposed. And they were married within three months. So both my brother and I were born here. We were the second wave, what I think of as the second wave born in the 1950s. We were um, the first born in Canada. So no, they both came in 1948, not at the same time and not from the same place. And if ever there was Bashert, because somebody wanted to fix up my mother with my father four years before they met. And my mother said, Abram from Radom, too Jewish, too Jewish. No, she wasn't. <laughs> and so they were, though, it, I could have been born in so many different countries with different father, different, but. I, they would not have met if had there been no war, they would not have met. They were both from Poland, but my father was 11 years older, came from a different, the other side of the country. They would never have met. Uh, I'm not saying there should have been a war so they would meet, but I'm saying <laughs> there were, but you know, there were a lot of relationships like that. And not all of them were very happy. There were a lot of misalliances, actually. And I do write about it, my mother's brother and sister, both married the Catholics who saved them. Um, it was, they were more marriages of obligation than love. And um, my parents, my mother lucked out, she lucked out. Thank you. I don't, I don't hear you, Alice. Sorry, my, my mute button is not. Um, oh, I said thank you, Sharon. No, I, heard, I, heard that. I just don't hear Alice. Okay, here we are. I'm here now, I think. Um, this is a, what's considered a real question for you. 
Yeah. What was the most what was the most difficult and emotional part of writing this book and putting it out in the world? Oh, what for you was what was the most challenging? The for last you? part. The last part. Not the first part. So explain so that she, to me. For the, because the she, she, sur she survived, mom survived the war. She didn't survive the cancer. It was the recent past. Um, uh, I wrote it, I began to write it quite soon after when things were very, very fresh. And, it, and in the writing of it, it was a way of still being with her. I could not have written it with such details now. Now it's nine years. It's nine years and 12 days. And I'm saying my mother, I'm not saying mommy, but absolutely, definitely the last part. The last part was the hardest, not the war period at all. The last part, the recent past. And perhaps um, a last question. What will you write next? <gasps> There's an audience out there that wants to know. Well, I have. I've written a novel that I consider a Holocaust free zone. Okay. Um, nothing to do with the war it's set in the recent past. It actually ends on the verge of the pandemic. Um, so it's got a provisional acceptance and I've got something else which is ready to show, but I don't believe I will ever do anything this important again, quite frankly. That's a beautiful tribute to your, to your mother, just saying that. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you, Sharon, and I, 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 we're going to get some formal thanks and, and a few words from Maria Messina from the library in a moment. But I want to thank you for being so wonderful to interview and so responsive to the questions. Thanks so much. It was a privilege to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you. So it is my privilege to close this event. I am Maria. I'm a librarian here at the Eleanor London Coates and Luke Library. We'd like to give a heartfelt thank you to the Montreal Holocaust Museum, Alice Herskovich, Sarah Fogg, Hobart Books, Adam Gardner, and of course, author Sharon Nadia Zeidman and her formidable mother, Renata. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon, and we hope that you purchase and share the book, I Want You to Be Free, available where books are sold and at our library. But at our library, there is a long waiting list. So we wish you all a wonderful Friday and a good weekend. It was a very meaningful event. And I hope that it stays with you. And I hope that the book stays with you. Thank you. Thank you.